Good morning. Where did the sun go? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and welcome to Sunday morning worship at Claremont Parish Church. Welcome if you're here in person, if you're joining us via the internet, or if you're on the end of a telephone line. However you're here, we're glad you're here, and we hope you enjoy this morning's service, which in actual fact is going to be brought to us by Martin this morning. Um, you can see there's a bunch of reprobates behind me. They'll be uh, leading the worship. <laughs> They'll be leading the worship. Uh, after the service, tea and coffee as usual at the, the back of the room. Please join us if you can. There are no fire drills planned, but in the unlikely event that the alarm goes off, as usual, I'll be waiting for you out in the car park. <laughs> right, I think that's all I have to say, so just take a few minutes to prepare ourselves for worship. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship. Whether you're here in person, whether you're watching on the internet now or later, whether you're on the phone, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, my name's Martin Russell. I'm one of the elders in Claremont here, and I'll be helped in the service today by Miriam Murphy, who's taking the All Age Talk, by Pamela Templeton, who's taking our reading, by Stephen Hay, who's bringing us prayer for others. Um, I'm helped also by the band and the tech team and by Alison Ross who's doing the signing for the, the BSL signing today. Welcome to worship. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. We're going to sing together, and the words as usual will be on the screens. Um, How lovely on the mountains.
Let's come to God in prayer, and as usual at this point, we'll say the Lord's Prayer at the conclusion of this prayer. We welcome you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are grateful that it is your desire to be with and among your people. We recognize that you are here to enrich our faith and deepen our relationship with you. Your desire is to help us, guide us, and direct us. You want the very best for us. Thank you for this moment of grace for all gathered here today. Too often we have failed you in thought, word, and deed. Forgive us for being unforgiving, especially when we have been forgiven so much. Forgive us for those moments when we've been lazy and thoughtless. Forgive us those moments when we could have made a positive difference, but chose indifference. Forgive us our sins. Help us to change, to use all of the resources you have given to us through scripture, the spirit, the church. Enable us to love when love is difficult. Encourage us to try and put right the things we have done. Fill us with your spirit and wisdom and a deeper love for all through Christ, our living Savior, in whose words we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Good morning, church. And um, today I'm going to talk about pets. So who has a pet? You want to put your hand? Adults can put hands up as well if you have pets. So see how many pet owners we have here. Oops, we have a little. Okay, we're gonna go for this one. Right, so um, what kind of pets have we got? Elspeth, what have you got? Dog. dog. What kind of dog? Okay, what's his name? Cole? Awesome, what have you got? Fish and a budgie. Fish and a budgie. And you look after them? So. <laughs> okay, what about Martin? What have you got? Fish? Do you look after your fish? How do you look after your fish? You feed the fish every morning. Awesome. What were you, Mia? Zebra finch called dove, just to confuse the matters. <laughs> and how do you look after your pet? Yeah, I've seen some of you used to feed the bird on your hand. Yeah, anybody else in the audience here who has, what have you got, Duncan? Fish. Fish, Fish. as well. And what do you have, Jan? Cats. Uh, cats, and how do you look after your cats, Jan? How do you look after your cats? Very well. Very well. <laughs> Are they fat cats? <laughs> or lean ones? <laughs> well, um, I, I grew up in a farm, so we had lots of animals, but I had my pets, and I have a very sad tale to tell you. Um, I, I think it was about 10, and I asked for a hamster for my birthday, and I loved my hamster. Nobody warned me the hamsters don't live as long as humans do. So only two years later, my hamster died, and I was really, really upset about it. I was distraught. Um, beyond myself, just couldn't think how could life go without my pet. And maybe some of you who have had pets have had that experience. Maybe next to our family and maybe our car, pets are the most important things in our lives. 
Um, what do you want to say, Elspeth? Yeah, it was sad, wasn't it? Did you comfort your friend? Yeah, you need a wee hug. Yeah, they all don't live very long, unfortunately. Now, has any one of you had a lamb as a pet? No? <laughs> there, you've had a lamb. Two. Did you have them in the house? So, <laughs> I've got a lamb costume here. I wonder if any of the kids would like to pretend to be a... It has to be the right size. Let's see what size we have. While we have these pet lambs here, I'm going to just talk about, in our scripture today, believe it or not, there is a pet lamb. Now, we read this piece of scripture and we don't realize it's a pet lamb. And it is also a sad tale, I'm afraid again, another sad tale. In this scripture, listen to it carefully, it says that on a certain day, all the Israelites were to choose a one yearling lamb and bring it to their homes for three and a half days. It is told in the tradition that this lamb became like a pet. The children would have played, like Margaret maybe brought the lamb home. What did you do with the, your pet lamb? Jumps, okay. Did you hear that, Rory and Elspeth, jumping? Apparently it does a lot of jumping. Yes, there we go, <laughs> right? And the children would have played with this lamb, fed with the lamb, and also the parents would have probably been part of this. Every household was to have a lamb and hold it for three and a half days. And then it says it was to present it at a Passover sacrifice. Now, to sacrifice, let's first of all talk about what does that mean, a sacrifice? It's one of those words that have lost a meaning for us sometimes because it's such a fancy word. But it really means setting something apart for God something that cost us, not something cheap, something that cost us set apart for God as a gift and thanks offering to God. And you wonder why did God tell to take this lamb into the house so it becomes a pet before the sacrifice? There was an emotional bond being created before the sacrifice happened. And I believe it is the idea is that sacrifice has to cost us something. If we just don't see it, have no involvement with it. Whatever we give to God doesn't cost us anything. It is not really a sacrifice. So if we give pennies when we have thousands in our bank account, if we give a one five minute when we have hundreds and hundreds of hours in our spare, if we give just something that we have no connection and give that as an offering to God, it does not have the same meaning. So sacrifice costs us something dearly. But the good news is that we are not the ones who initiate the sacrifice. In the Old Testament, especially in the Passover story, we see actually the greater story played out beforehand. So the story in the Passover lamb, in the New Testament, we hear that Jesus, Jesus God's own son, was the Passover lamb. And if he was crucified on the very hour when the Passover lambs were crucified in every single household. 
God gave something he had emotional connection to that was the dearest to him for our sake. And he's then asking us to do the same thing in return. So it's not that we loved him, but he loved us first. It's not that we chose him, but he chose us first. And it's not that we give him something that cost us something. He has first of all given us everything and then asks us as a token to give something that means something to us. I think that's a very good impression of a lamb, Rory. <laughs> so listen carefully to the scripture and bear in your mind these little lambs and think of the connection and think of sacrifice being something that is attached to you, means something to you, and sometimes the dearest thing to you that you might want to offer to God and set apart for God. Thank you. We are going to sing um, I'm Special for God Has Loved Me, and then we're going to go to the back halls with the young ones. made use of technology and having the live stream and the phone for allowing people who were at home to hear the services. And then during the COVID pandemic, we recorded the services and were able to let you all hear them on your laptops, your computers, whatever. And then we're all glad to get back to the sanctuary to worship together. But of course, some people were still unable to be with us because they were unable to get out of their homes or whatever. And one of the things that we did do on one occasion was when Gordon Palmer had COVID, he actually recorded the sermon. So we were all here watching him deliver the sermon on the screens. Now, it had occurred to some of us that it would be nice if people who were still stuck at home and were always very important and regular members of the congregation could actually contribute in some way to worship even though they were at home. So today Pamela Stephen, uh, Templeton is going to bring us the reading 
uh, by video. Over to Pamela. This morning's readings are from Exodus chapter 12. The first reading is verses 1 to 13, and the second reading is verses 29 to 32. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbour having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water but roast it over a fire, with the head, legs and internal organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood that will be assigned for you on the houses where you are. And when I see blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. And then from verse 29. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon, and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night and there was loud wailing in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Up, leave my people, you and the Israelites. Go, worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and herds as you have said and go, and also bless me. Amen. Thank you, Pamela. We're going to sing again. There is a Redeemer reminding us of the cost of Jesus as a sacrificial lamb.
Today we're continuing our focus group series on Exodus, Freedom to Serve God. John Collar took us through the story of Moses' calling at the burning bush last week. Today we're looking at the Passover. So what's happened in between? After his calling, Moses and Aaron went to Egypt, met the elders of Israel, and gave them God's message. Then he met Pharaoh, and he passed on God's message as wanting his people to go to worship him in the wilderness. Pharaoh was incensed and refused. He insisted the Israelites had to make bricks without straw, but God promised deliverance for his people. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. It's a bit of an odd expression. Sounds like it wouldn't do much good for pumping the blood around his body. Maybe like a robocop or cyborg with spare metallic parts for heart. But more understandable if you think of it as the opposite of softening his heart. So God sent plagues on Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Well, we all remember the plagues, don't we? So how many can you remember? What plagues were sent on the Egyptians? Can't hear you? Need to speak up? Frogs, yes. Why do we all remember the frogs? <laughs> Boils, yep. Locusts. Water turned to blood. Sorry, Idris. Water turned to blood. The water turned to blood, that's right. So that's what we've got so far. Four, five, something like that. Darkness. Darkness shall cover the earth, yes. Any others? Oh, the firstborn died. The firstborn all died, which is where we've got to today. You're not done badly. <laughs> That's the list. Blood, frogs, gnats, flies. Sounds like East Kilbride in a <laughs> sultry evening. <laughs> Livestock, where they came out in rashes or boils. The plague of boils, plague of hail. That sounds like he's going right in the middle of winter too. <laughs> Locusts, darkness, and the plague on the firstborn. And it's as part of the story of the plague on the firstborn that we hear of the Passover. I thought I knew all about the Passover until I came to study it for this sermon. It would have been very boring. Maybe you think it still is, but there's far more to it than I thought. Or maybe I'm just getting old and forgetful. It's not as if Pharaoh hadn't been warned. Moses had been told to tell him of God's message or warning. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 22 to 23, Then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son, and I told you, let my son go so that he may worship you, me. But you refuse to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn son. I'm going to borrow one of John Collins' devices today with alliterative headings. We've all heard about the three R's at school. Well, they weren't really three R's in a way because it's, every word doesn't begin with an R. Reading, writing, and arithmetic. But I'm going one stage further with four R's. So the first one is retribution. The Israelites had originally traveled to Egypt to escape the famine. When Joseph became the prime minister of Egypt, they were a relatively small family, but God blessed them and made them fruitful, and they became a great host. But while the initial Pharaoh welcomed them into Egypt, later Pharaohs and the Egyptians enslaved them. They became their manual workers living under hard times, and God had heard their cry. So he sent Moses to lead them out of Egypt and wrought retribution on the Egyptians for what they'd done to his chosen people. Pharaoh and the Egyptians hadn't listened to God. Retribution could also be looked on as judgment for the enslaving of God's chosen people, but also because of the idolatry in Egypt, not recognizing God as the only true God, but having multiple other gods. Indeed, the Pharaohs were also often regarded as gods in themselves. It's dangerous when we suppress people or let other things become more important to us than God. 
And in doing so, God also brought redemption to Israel. It's a funny word, redemption or redeem. I never thought I would use this illustration in a service, but here goes. The first time I learned about redemption when I was a child was to do with pawnbrokers. It wasn't people we would have dealt with very often. You were poor if you regularly went to the pawnbroker, but had sympathy who were those who were forced to. I think I've only been in a pawnbroker's once, and it was quite recently, when we were looking for foreign currency and I went to the bank. They didn't have any currency on the premises. You had to order it in. But the very helpful cashier said that Ramsden's just along the way had foreign currency at very good rates of exchange. So that's where I got it. They've obviously diversified from purely pawnbroking. But at the pawnbrokers, as I understand it, you gave up goods for a loan of money, and later you could get them back when you paid the relevant price, with interest, of course. Redeeming something or someone brings, means bringing them out of their present state into freedom on payment of the relevant price, be it money, sacrifice, or blood. In this context, it means to, to redeem something means to atone or make amends for sin, error, or evil. And the other meaning of redemption that I remembered was this redemption songs. In actual fact, when I looked at this, it's been on the go a long time, I realized that my name's in the cover in my mother's handwriting. So it must have been about the first music book that I'd actually got. Redemption songs for the redeemed people. Jesus redeemed us on the cross when he took our sins upon himself and paid the price with his body and his blood. We are a redeemed people. Do you ever think of yourself as redeemed? Redeemed from slavery to sin? Redeemed to freedom? Freedom to serve God, not to waste our lives on other things. Jesus was the Lamb of God, as stated right from the beginning of John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 29, when John the Baptist says, look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, like the Passover lamb, a sacrifice of body and blood. But the Passover was also a festival of remembrance, a reminder, when the Israelites were to remember God's act of redemption and freeing them from slavery and bondage in Egypt, in verse 14. To remind them of this and the importance of it, God decreed that this was to be the first month of the year, that their calendar was to start from this month, the month of Aviv or Abib, which means young head of grain. It was later called Nisan from Babylonian times. In the new ancient Near East, New Year festivals normally coincided with the new season of life in nature. The designation of this month as Israel's religious new year reminded Israel that its life as the people of God was grand, grounded in God's redemptive act in the Exodus. My old school, Hutchie, has been in the news recently because the teachers are planning to go on strike. And it was, the headline was, the teachers at Nicola Sturgeon's school were planning to go on strike. Of course, it wasn't Hutchison's grammar school when I was there, it was Hutchison's boys' grammar school because the boys and the girls had separate schools. Hutchie, as far as I know, is still the only private school on the south side of Glasgow. And you had to have enough money to send your children there because it was a fee-paying school. And the south side of Glasgow included places like Newlands, Pollock Shields, Gifnock, Newton Mearns, where a lot of the Jews lived. So we had quite a few Jews in our class because they usually had good jobs like bankers, lawyers, um, things like that. So we were used to the fact that the Jews in those days were a substantial minority of the class. 
They got extra holidays. Didn't please us all that much. But it wasn't the time of the Passover so much. The Israelite agricultural calendar began in the autumn and it became adopted as the civil cal calendar. So this year it's from the evening of the 15th of September to the evening of the 17th. My busty, as it happens. It's called by another R, Rosh Hashanah. You might seem to say that this all seems very strange having two separate new years, but it's not quite as daft as you think. We celebrate New Year on January the 1st, but the fiscal or financial New Year is in early April. If you support a sports club, the new season depends on when the league starts. The church's calendar might well be regarded as starting after the end of the su summer holidays, when everything starts up again and all the organizations get going. And celebrations or festivals often relate more to pre-existing pagan ones. Whenever in the year Jesus was born, it almost certainly wasn't late December or in the bleak midwinter. We didn't even get the dating of the year right. And Easter depends on the cycles of the moon. Even the name Easter probably comes from the Germanic goddess of the spring. But if you want to remember when Passover falls, it's easy because Jesus ate the Passover meal with his disciples before his crucifixion. So the day before Good Friday. And as Miriam was saying earlier, it wasn't a cheap sacrifice either. A one-year-old male lamb brought into the household for a few days and then sacrificed. A one-year-old male lamb was the equivalent of a 30-year-old man. Males were worth more than females, and it had to be without blemish. Looking forward to Jesus, as stated in 1 Peter 1, verses 18 to 20, you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but wasn't, was revealed in these last times for your sake. God didn't make a cheap sacrifice for us either. One year old lamb, equivalent to a 30 year old man, Jesus' age when he died. It was to be a blood sacrifice, one life for another. The lamb was roasted whole, like shepherds and their sheep, in haste, like the making of bread without yeast, as they were to leave in a hurry. Cloak tucked into their belt, sandals on feet, staff in hand, roasted with bitter herbs, endive and shikari, were indigenous to Egypt, again to remind them of their years of servitude and bitterness. The blood on the door marked the house as one that God could pass over, but it was also a symbolism in marking the home as where God's chosen people lived, the Israelites, not the Egyptians, and they would be safe under the sign of blood. The killing of the firstborn may seem to us barbaric. How could God do such a thing? But Pharaoh's refusal to acknowledge the true God or to let his people go despite all the other plagues, forced an escalation of the violence, as we see so often in conflict, like the war in Ukraine. God was showing him both how powerless Pharaoh was, and by killing the firstborn of the animals as well, which were often sacred to the gods in Egypt, was exerting his power as the true God and showing the Egyptians how powerless their gods were. It also caused havoc with the succession to the throne, which naturally went to the firstborn. Verse 29 tells us that God struck down the firstborn from Pharaoh to the prisoner, the highest to the lowest, and there was a loud wailing in Egypt. Finally, Pharaoh gets it and summons Moses and Aaron, which he had said earlier he would never do again, and tell them to go and bless me also, looking after his own skin. Eventually, he has recognized the sovereign Lord, but as you'll know, not for long. The fourth R is response. God gave Moses detailed instructions for the Passover, 
what it would entail, what they had to do in detail, where they had to daub the blood as a sign of God's redemption. But they had to obey him. That was their response. They had to demonstrate their obedience to God as his chosen people. And Pharaoh's failure to obey God's commands and acknowledge his sovereignty was his response. He brought all the plagues on his people. So that's the four R's. Retribution, Redeemer, Reminder or Remembrance, Response. And over all this, I think the underlying theme that comes from this passage is the fact of obedience. Obedience to God. How do we respond to him? As we sang, Jesus is our Redeemer. Would we have to make our response to him? Do we truly love and obey him? Is he really our first and only priority in life? How much does his sacrifice mean for us? Do we live as a redeemed people, willing, eager, enthusiastic to serve our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer? And how well do we obey his command to go and make disciples? What is our response? What is your response? Amen. Let's come to God in prayer. Let's pray. We thank you, almighty God, for your great gift of salvation, planned from all eternity and brought to fruition in Christ. We thank you for the love that governs everything you do, so freely given to all of your people. We thank you for your presence, especially in our most difficult and challenging times of life, for the opportunity to serve you and the honor of being your people, for the gift of life, the gift of grace, the promise of eternal life and the renewal of all things. Lord God, for all your gracious benefits, we give you thanks. But Lord, let us not just give thanks in our hearts and minds, but demonstrate our commitment to you in service, in reaching out to all your children as you commanded us to do. May your spirit guide and direct us in all we do. Amen. Let us now stand and commit ourselves in the saying of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born under, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please keep standing and we'll sing again. The Spirit lives to set us free. Walk in the light.
Before coming to prayer, let's remind ourselves of what Paul said to the believers in Thessalonica. At 1 Thess- Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 to 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now let us pray. Lord God, we thank you that we can come here today and we have the ability to give our time, talents and our money for your work throughout your earth. May these monetary offerings today today be blessed and used for your purpose as you would see fit. Lord God, we rejoice in the freedoms that we have. We have the freedom to express ourselves how we want. We have the freedom to say what we want and we have the freedom to praise you wherever and however we want. Guide us and do not let us abuse the freedom you have given to us that we enjoy here in the UK. For many around the world, your world, do not have such freedoms. Many still have to meet in secret and praise your name in countries where believing in your awesome power is a crime. We pray for those people who cannot openly express to their friends, neighbours and colleagues that they are a Christian without risking their safety. We pray for missionaries throughout the world spreading your word. Protect them and give them the strength to continue in what is sometimes a difficult and dangerous calling. We are also aware that as the role of missionaries is to bring your word to those who have never heard it, that is now the role for people in Scotland. People are now coming here to spread your word from countries where we once sent missionaries. Lord God, we know we may sometimes turn away from you and follow our own path, thinking that is better. But you are always there. Even though we turn from you and your guidance, we can always come back. And you are there, waiting for us. Help us to listen and be more willing to hear what you say, and sometimes more importantly, to do what you ask, even though it's difficult or what we do not want to do ourselves. You led the Israelites out of Egypt. They listened to your words and followed what your commands said. Through this, they were saved. We pray for those of our number who cannot join in with us physically here today. May they feel the same love that we are experiencing and feeling here today through the internet or on the telephone. And may they feel able to share in the community we have here today. May we praise you every day during this week. And through our praise, may we, may we be a beacon that guides someone we know to you, to the salvation that you offer. Amen. Morning, folks. Uh, are you sitting comfortably? <laughs> I've got a horrible feeling I might have dropped something as well. Anyway, um, we'll start with um, we had a kit session on Tuesday night, and um, the update on the mission planning is that there is no update um, other than a letter that was sent out to presbyters. That's people like ministers and uh, presbytery elders, um, people like that. A letter saying that the mission planning action group is still sifting through all the submissions. Um, So we still wait to hear what comes from that. I also said to you last week that um, the session would be asked to approve the appointment of a new um, clerk to the board. That was done, they did that. And the new clerk to the board is Eleanor Duffy. And we wish you well, Eleanor. <laughs> um, now, just running through the um, other notices, uh, a reminder that next Saturday, or this Saturday coming, the 20th, uh, there's the coffee morning for Blacklaw Black Primary School's outdoor library. Um, please come along and support that. It would be great for the kids to know that you um, support them all and give them all the encouragement you can. I think there's going to be bits of entertainment and other things going on too, so that will be, be a good one this Saturday. Uh, the deadline for the June Clarion was actually last Tuesday, but there has been very few contributions sent in so far, or there hadn't been by Friday. I think there might be one or two more now. If there's not enough, then the, June, the Clarion, that issue just won't happen. So if you have anything at all that you um, would like to see or share, can you please send it to 
Claremont Clary and at something or other. You'll find it in the back of your old one, um, .co.uk or something like that. Um, if you can send it in this week, please, um, and it will still, you know, they'll be able to print the, the clarion for June. Um, a reminder about the afternoon tea, which is, full, is completely sold out, but if you owe money, it would be very nice if you could pay for it today. If you can't pay for it today, then as soon as possible, but um, Helen Cuthbertson, I'm sure, will be quite happy to take your money sometime today before you leave the building, or maybe she'll not let you leave the building, I don't know. Um, I had a phone call from Gary the other day who had told you a couple of weeks ago that he got an award from Tesco for his outstanding customer service. He has also been given an award by the University of the West of Scotland for outstanding work on a paper he's written as part of his business course. Um, so Gary's not with us this morning. He's um, spending some time with his dad this weekend. So just to say well done, Gary, and um, he's promised to bring his actual award in and shows when, when he gets it, um, when he's presented with it. So um, that's great stuff from Gary. Um, next Sunday, which is the 21st, is the, the inter-church football match, and Claremont has a wee team entering that. Um, so uh, Miriam has asked that it would be really nice if um, as many people as possible could go and support them. I forgot to ask her the title. Oh, oh no, I've got it here. Wait a minute. A leaflet here. Uh, it's between two and four o'clock next Sunday down at St Kenneth's. Um, that's it, down West Main Road. Um, so it would be lovely. The team is called the Claremont Marvels, and let's hope they have a marvellous time. And um, we can go and cheer them on next Sunday. Uh, today, Miriam is hosting, a, 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 ably assisted by Anne Jackson, is hosting a lunch for the um, leaders of the uniformed organisations, just as a thank you for everything they do for the young people in the church. And um, we had a wee conversation, and I would just like to give them my thanks too, because it's a very, it's very important work they do. And on behalf of everybody at Claremont, I think we we all owe you thanks for looking after the weans and giving them, um, trying to bring them a, a bit of the, the Lord's word as you do it. So well done. Um, two more. The notice about the safeguarding um, courses that are in the update. The online course on the 20th of June is now full, so if you haven't got on it, you can do it. <laughs> and um, we've all, I've also got a note here from got, um, Hannah Shanks has got um, order forms for bedding plants if you want to get anything from the plant sale, which um, supports Parkinson's. Um, Hannah has um, leaf, um, order forms. <laughs> My mind's going. Order forms with her today, and um, she'll be happy to take your orders or give you give you a form today. That's it. Thank you, and thank you, Martin, for this morning's message. Thank you. Let's continue to praise our wonderful God, the splendour of the King.
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.